In the first two entries of this series, we talked about how we view the universe and how this view changed and evolved. It got more complex as time went by and the more we observed and theorized since the time of the Greeks and even before that. We also discussed movement through space and relative motion and relative time. Ideas that came much later in our picture of the universe and that are comparatively deeper into advanced physics. Today, we look at the expansion of space and its early discovery. If you look at the night sky, you will see a huge number of stars in the absence of visual noise from light around you, in the middle of the city or such. If you gaze and study the sky, you'll notice that as time goes by and the earth moves, some of the dots of light appear to move faster and at different rate compared to others. In fact, some stars appear to be fixed. So what is going on? The stars you are looking at have different sizes and different distances. Given that, the closer the star is to us, the easier it is for us to see its movement. You might remember as a child driving in a car and looking at the moon through the window and thinking that the moon is following the car, because no matter how far you go, it looks like it's in the same place. This is because the moon is much further than the trees that are moving in front of you and you are comparing it to. The same effect happens when we measure the apparent movement of stars. Stars that are too far for us to see look like they are fixed. Proxima Centauri is considered to be close to us. And just to put things into perspective, it's about four light years away from us. Our sun is only eight light minutes away. Now you know what I mean when I use the phrase close about Proxima Centauri. I say the word close very lightly. The universe is massive. Edwin Hubble the man who the Hubble telescope is named after, was instrumental in our modern picture of the universe. He was able to demonstrate that there are in fact not just stars, but other galaxies that are far away from us, which changed the scale of our thinking about the world. Astronomers developed techniques and got good at measuring distances to different stars. But the further the star is, like we spoke about earlier, the more difficult it gets for us to get a direct measurement. So Hubble set out to find indirect ways and he wanted to find distances to other galaxies and not just stars. The apparent brightness we see on a star depends on two factors. How much light this star radiates and how far it is from us. Hubble noted that a certain type of star always has the same luminosity when they are close enough for us to measure. Based on that, his idea to measure the distances to other galaxies was basically this. If we found that same type of star in a different galaxy, we could assume that it has the same luminosity. In other words, it radiates the same amount of light. If we then measure the distance to multiple stars of that same type in this galaxy and all the measurements match, then we could argue that this is a good reason to say that the distance to that galaxy is basically the distance to these stars that it is matching. Based on this assumption and technique, Edwin Hubble managed to measure the distance to nine different galaxies at that time. But there is a question here. What do I mean by the type of star? How do we know what type of star a certain star is? There is a certain characteristic feature of stars that we can look at to find out the color of the light it emits. Newton discovered that if we decompose a beam of light by passing it through a prism, the result on the other side is a set of colors. For example, if the light from the sun passed through a prism, it results in a distinct color of a rainbow. In fact, this is how rainbows form. The water droplets act as a prism, and when the sunlight refracts 
in them it creates a rainbow. This slight decomposition, the result here, is called the spectrum of light for a star. Certain stars have the same unique spectrum. If we focus the telescope on a specific star, we can similarly get the spectrum for that star. And by knowing that, we can tell what type of star it is. Basically, what spectrum does it have after it got decomposed? In the 1920s, astronomers were observing the spectra of stars in other galaxies to find if they are similar to the ones in our galaxy. And they stumbled upon a very interesting observation. The colors that exist and the ones that are missing from the spectrum are actually similar to the ones in our galaxy. But they were all shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. This has a groundbreaking implication, and to understand it, we will look into the Doppler effect. When you are standing in the street and an ambulance with the emergency siren on passes by, the closer it gets to you, the siren sounds different. When it approaches, the sound gets higher in pitch. And when it starts moving away, the sound fades and the pitch decreases. The siren coming from the car is the same, so what makes it sound different is the fact that the ambulance is moving towards you and then away from you. This shift in frequency is called the Doppler effect. Basically, when the sound source is moving away, the sound shifts in frequency towards the low end of the spectrum. This looks like this in the frequency spectrum. On the right side is high-pitched sound moving closer to you. On the left side is a low-pitched sound corresponding to something that is moving away from you. This effect happens with light as well, but we can't hear light, we see light. A low-frequency wave in a spectrum of light is red-colored, so when we look at a beam of light coming from a star or a galaxy and we notice that the light is shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, it means that the star or the galaxy is moving away from us, just like the ambulance. It is the same Doppler effect we witness every day, but now in terms of light. Galaxies that are red shifted are moving away from us, and galaxies that are blue shifted are moving toward us. In the following years, Hubble spent a long time cataloging and noting down distances to galaxies and whether they are moving towards us or away from us. Everyone thought at the time that the movement of galaxies is random, so they expected to find as many blue-shifted galaxies as many red-shifted galaxies. But Hubble showed that almost all galaxies are moving away from us with redshifts. Not only that, but also that the further the galaxy is from us, the faster it moves away. The universe is expanding, meaning that the space between the galaxies is increasing. Before that, physicists and everyone else thought that the universe is static and non-moving, and that includes Einstein, who insisted that the universe is static and actually added a term into his own formula that meant that the universe is static in his theory of general relativity. It was called the cosmological constant, an anti-gravity type of force. Einstein later described this as his biggest mistake or biggest blunder. Alexander Friedman, a physicist from Russia, has predicted what Hubble had found some time before he actually found it. He made two assumptions that were just an approximation of the real universe, and based on these, he made his predictions. The assumptions were this. First, the universe looks the same in whichever direction we look at. Second, is that this is true looked at from any point in the universe. Friedman's model of the universe was vindicated by a lucky dramatic accident. In 1965, 
Penzias and Wilson were testing a microwave detector in a lab. And during the testing, they found that the device is picking up a consistent noise every time, and it is more noise than it ought to pick up. So they were finding ways to eliminate the extra noise. They noticed that there are bird droppings on their detector and removed them, and the noise persisted. They checked their equipment and connectors, but the noise persisted. They changed the direction of where the antenna is pointing, making it at an angle instead of pointing upwards, but the noise persisted. And it was the same. In fact, the noise was the same and ever existing day and night and throughout the year as Earth moves around the Sun. This is indeed very strange. Maybe the noise is coming from outside the solar system. But what is that noise? Without realizing it, Penzias and Wilson had found the cosmic background radiation, one of the evidences we have for the Big Bang, which we will discuss more later. What Penzias and Wilson found is Friedman's first assumption. No matter where you look in the universe, it is the same. There is something that is homogeneous about the universe. During the same time they were doing these studies, Robert Dickey and James Peebles were working on microwaves also and investigating a theory by George Gamow, who is by the way a student of Alexander Friedman. And the theory was that the early universe should have been hot, dense, and white glowing. Dickey and Peebles said that the glow from this early radiation in the universe should be detected now as it would reach us, but because of the expansion of the universe, it means that the light would be so redshifted that it would be detected as microwaves because they are short in wavelength. So they set out to try to find that radiation. But this is exactly what Penzias and Wilson had already found. It is like Peebles and Dickey knew what to look for, but they didn't find it while Wilson and Penzias found it, and they just didn't know what it is. Wilson and Penzias were later awarded the Nobel Prize, which was a little bit tough on Dickey and Peebles, and even probably harder on George Gamow, who originated the first hypothesis in the first place. This is a strange, tangled situation because we found an empirical result before we even came up with the hypothesis to find it. In the case of Wilson and Penzias, that is, because it was an accident. Now, Friedman's model, like I said earlier, said that the universe looked the same in any direction we look at, and that this is true no matter where you are in the universe. We found that galaxies are moving away from us through a redshift no matter which direction we look at, which is Friedman's first condition. Now, it is easy to think that if all galaxies are moving away from us as the universe expands, it means that we must be the center of the universe, because everything is moving away from us no matter where we look. But in reality, this situation is like an inflating balloon with dots on it. As you inflate the balloon, the distance between the dots increases altogether at the same time, and there is no one single dot which is the center. And it also means that if you stand on any of those dots and you look in any direction, all the other galaxies, or dots in this case, would be moving away from you as the balloon expands. Which is actually Friedman's second condition. That the first condition is true no matter where you are in the universe. But what does the universe look like as it expands? We know that gravity is a force of attraction that keeps things together, so it should slow down the expansion or even stop it altogether. There are three possible solutions to this. We know that gravity exists and we also know that the universe is expanding, so what are these solutions? First, the universe expands but gravity continuously slows down the expansion until it eventually stops it. 
then it will cause the universe to contract back again because of gravity. So that is a universe where it expands, stops, and then goes back together as if you click rewind. The second solution is that the expansion is actually so fast that gravity cannot catch up. So it may slow it down a little bit, but never stop it. So it keeps expanding, but slowing down until it stops and stays still. The third solution or third model is that the expansion is just fast enough to avoid recollapse. So it keeps expanding forever and it doesn't even stop, but it keeps getting slower and slower because of gravity. All three Friedman models suggest that at some point back in time, and this is about 10 to 20,000 million years ago, the distance between the galaxies must have been zero, and then they expanded. At such conditions, which is at the Big Bang, all our theories and mathematics break down, and it is impossible to use the tools we have to analyze the universe at that time. Not to mention we weren't even there. The density and temperature of the universe must have been infinite, and infinity isn't the most useful input into a math equation a lot of the time. In the beginning of this series, we were talking about how people were talking about our place in the universe and whether we are the center or not, whether the Earth is flat or not, and by us I mean the planet. We have seen in this chapter and as we discover more about the expansion of the universe, just how insignificant our place might be compared to the vastness of the universe. Our pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan would call it, is just that, a dot. Astronomy is indeed the most humbling science I have personally known and come across. We are talking now about what did the whole universe look like in the beginning and how is it going to look like in the end? This has been looking at physics at an extraordinarily large scale. We're talking about the universe. Join me next time as we discuss the extraordinarily small scale, the most fascinating feat of physics and strange reality we deal with every day. Quantum Mechanics. <laughs>